Portia is kind of like Pennywise the Clown. Everything's nice and safe for a while. Then, when your guard is down, he pulls your little brother into the sewer and bites his arm off! Okay, you gotta stop, you're scaring me. In the 80s, it was the 959. In the aughts, it was the Carrera GT. Porsche's latest supercar, nay, hypercar, is the scariest of them all. This is everything you need to know to get up to speed on the Porsche 918 Spider. <laughs> We're gonna get to the 918, but before we even scratch the surface, we gotta talk about the cars that led to it. The roots go much deeper than just the few years that it took to develop the car. Much of what Porsche did while developing the 918 was learned while making their first production supercar, the 959. Let's rewind. <laughs> oh, that's hot. That's hot. The year is 1981. Porsche's chief engineer, Helmuth Bott, can't sleep at night because he's worried about the future of the 911. He approaches managing director, Peter Schutz, with his concern, and he's like, Peter, I think maybe we should make an updated 911 piece of your drive. Peter's like, I don't like it. I love it. What? But you said, you said you did not like it. I thought you did not. I know, but then I said I love it. I know that was my favorite part. And so Helmut took a sequential turbocharged 2.9 liter six cylinder boxer out of the Porsche 956 race car and updated it with Bosch Motronic fuel injection, air cooled cylinders and water cooled heads. The engine made 444 hearse and 369 dirt. Other Porsches at the time had parallel turbos that resulted in an abrupt on off acceleration, but not this one. The use of sequential turbos in the 959 meant smoother delivery across the power band. Bott and his team developed a unique manual transmission with five gears plus a Galanda gear for off-roading. The Porsche Stürgüpplung all-wheel drive system allowed torque to be dynamically distributed based on driving conditions and could send up to 80% of the power to the rear wheels. This feature was way ahead of its time. It would be many years before it started showing up in other production cars. The body was made of lightweight aluminum with a Nomex floor and Kevlar body panels. No bullets are getting in this Porsche. The 959 was truly futuristic. But like any other prototype, the 959 had to be tested. Helmut thought that Group B rally racing was the perfect arena to test his all new all wheel drive beast, but he still needed to get approval. So he went back to Peter Schutz and was like, Peter, I think we should test our all-wheel drive car in Group B Rally. Peter's like, I don't like it. I love it. My God, him know you're going to give me a heart attack. The 959 was almost ready to race when the worst thing happened. Group B ceased to be. Porsche had already sunk too much money into the project to just give up on it, so they pushed through and finished developing the road version. When it finally rolled off the production line in 1987, it was the fastest street legal production car in the world. The 959 was able to reach 190 miles per. It was considered the most technologically advanced sports car at the time with features like variable suspension height, a thief proof stereo and an ugly steering wheel. It was the hottest toddy around. Psst. Ouch, Grandma. Your cocktails are spicy. <sniffs> oh. Oh, I always sit in the splash zone. But Ferrari was about to stir the pot. Eight months after the release of the 959, Ferrari debutted the F40. The new stallion posted an official top speed of 199 miles per, two more than the 959. I know that because I'm a math boy. Ferrari snatched the title of the world's fastest street legal production car from Porsche and a supercar rivalry was born. The next year, a German magazine called Auto Motor Sport held a competition at the Nardo Ring in Southern Italy. Ferrari sent two F40s, which both achieved 199 per on the track. Porsche sent their brand new 959S. This baby had bigger turbos and it bumped the horsepower up to 510. That's like 2000 horsepower in 1980s horsepower. It screamed around the Nardo Ring and posted a top speed of 211 miles per, an impressive number for the Porsche. The victory over Ferrari was purely symbolic though as Porsche had only made 29 of the 959 S's. It didn't count as a production car. The Ferrari F40 held onto its title. The Roof Yellowbird also raced that day and beat everyone by hitting 213 miles per. You wanna learn more about that car? Check out this episode of Up to Speed.
Towards the end of the 90s, Porsche started designing what would later become the Carrera GT, the older sibling of the 918. There's a misconception when it comes to the Carrera GT. A lot of people think that its engine came from a Le Mans prototype, but it actually comes from an F1 engine. Porsche manufactured F1 motors in the 80s for a company called Tag Heuer. Those engines ended up winning more than two dozen F1 races. The early 90s didn't go as well. In 1991, Porsche developed an engine for the footwork team, but the B12 was so bad that footwork canceled Porsche's contract and switched to a Ford engine mid-season. Porsche had been developing a 3.5 liter V10 for the upcoming 92 season, and since their contract was canceled, they didn't have a car to put it in. Great! Cut to 1998. Friends was in its fourth season. Coffee mugs were huge. And Porsche had been doing well in Le Mans for the past few years. They had three wins tucked under their later hosen. Two with Porsche powered TWR prototypes and one with Porsche's very own 911 GT1 prototype. At the same time, Porsche was developing another prototype, the 9R3. To comply with the new Le Mans rules, the 9R3 was supposed to have a turbocharged flat six, but Porsche designer Viet Hunder Koper said, nah dog, that inline six is heavy AF. We need to replace it. After all, the inline six was race proven. It had a number of Le Mans victories, but Haida Koper explained that the heavy motor was the design's major weakness for the 9R3, and a new engine needed to be developed. Porsche responded by canceling the project. A few months later, Haida Koper was presented with the V10 and he was like, this is it, this is the engine. We should put this in the 9R3. And so they did, but not before bumping the 3.5 liter displacement first up to 5.5 liters. That's like drinking 3.5 liters of Mountain Dew and then being like, I think I'm thirsty for another two liters of Mountain Dew. The V10 powered 9R3 prototype got just two days into testing before it too was canceled. Porsche needed the engineers from the race division and the extra cash to speed up development on the Cayenne, the brand's first four-door model. Only two drivers got to drive the 9R3. Bomb. Mullick and Alan McNish, the two luckiest sons of anarchy ever in the world. Porsche had been working on another secret prototype though, the Carrera GT, which debuted at the Paris Motor Show in 2000. Stuffed inside of it was the 5.5 liter V10. People freaking loved it and Porsche was like, okay. In 2003, the Cayenne debuted. It was an immediate success. Everyone bought them. Porsche was flush with cash and decided that with all this interest that people had in the Carrera GT, they could finally afford to funnel money back into producing it. And so, in 2004, the Porsche Carrera GT made its debut. Made its debut. With it, an upgraded 5.7 liter V10. Putting out 605 hertz per at 8400 RPM. The thing sounds like a dang F1 car and that's for good reason, it comes from one. <laughs> The cylinders are coated with nickel and a silicon solution, just like an F1 car. It has sodium cooled exhaust valves. And did I mention it has the world's first twin plated carbon ceramic clutch? That sounds expensive. Did I also mention that it's just like a friggin' F1 car? It has the chassis from the 98 Le Mans winning GT1. That's a carbon fiber reinforced plastic monocoque. Another first in a production car. The entire chassis only weighs 220 pounds. That's like me. All that power. Power translates into a 3.5 second zero to 60 and a top speed of 205. The Carrera GT is a full court dunk. Nothing but net, straight up swish. It wasn't alone in the spotlight, however. Porsche was actually pretty late to the show. Had it not been sidelined by the Cayenne, the Carrera GT might have been one of the first in the new wave of supercars. But alas, they were playing catch up. In 2001, Lamborghini had come out with the Murcielago with a top speed of 206. A year later, the Enzo came out from Ferrari. The V12 powered stallion had 651 horsepower and could achieve 221 miles per. A year after that, Mercedes, introduced them SLR McLaren. It was only after these cars debuted, plus, you know, the Pagani Zonda, the Koenigsegg 8S, and some others. But after that, the Carrera GT came out. The early 2000s was an embarrassment of supercars. There might have been a lot of supercars at the time, but the Carrera GT did stand out. It wasn't the fastest in the flock, but drivers loved the hair trigger acceleration, nimble handling, and radical design. It was an engineering miracle. 
And Jay Leno says it's the most scared he's ever been in a car. Once again, Porsche departed from their classic motif and once again, it paid off for him. The Carrera GT lasted only a few years in production. 1,270 were produced, most of which were sold in the US. And finally, it's time to talk about the 918. The Porsche 918 Spyder is one of three hypercars dubbed the Holy Trinity, along with the McLaren P1 and the Ferrari LaFerrari by Ferrari. The 918 is a hybrid electric gas monster pushing the boundaries of engineering and giving those other clowns a run for their money. It broke a long-standing record at the Nürburgring and was the first street legal production car to get a lap under seven minutes there. Its six minute, 57 second Nürburgring lap broke the record pre previously set by the Dodge Viper ACR at 712. That's 15 seconds in one lap. The first time the world saw the 918 was as a concept car in 2010 at the 80th Geneva Motor Show. It received over 2,000 expressions of interest, which convinced Porsche to put it into production. And in October of 2013, the first of the 918 Spiders rolled off the production line. It's got a naturally aspirated 4.6 liter V8 based off the RS Spider Le Mans prototype. The beltless gas engine delivers just over 600 hertz per at 8,600 RPM on its own. Then two additional electric motors, one on each end of the car, give the 918 an extra 282 hearses, making the total output a clean, mean 887 buff horses. That's a lot of muscular horses, but it doesn't mean much without torque. Luckily, the 918 produces 944 pounds of it. The Spider has Four modes, electric, an entirely electric mode that has a range of 18 miles and a top speed of 92 miles per hour. Hybrid mode, which delivers the best efficiency, sport, a power-centered hybrid mode, and race mode. But definitely the most exciting thing about the 918 is that it has a hot lap button. For extra lightning, car and driver tested the 918 and achieved a tub thump in zero to 60 time of 2.2 seconds, which they claim is the fastest car to 60 they ever tested. It broke Motor Trend's figure eight record at 22.2 seconds. Get it with the optional Visoc package and it cuts 80 pounds and lets the car achieve a top speed of 211 miles per. It's a spider after all, which means it's a convertible. A convertible that can go 211. All that wind would rip your head off going that fast. So there's actually a little spoiler that you can put above the windshield that's supposed to diffuse and redirect the air going in the cabin. The level of detail that went into designing this car is mind boggling. Name another car that has a little eyebrow spoiler. Oh wait, the Porsche 918 was in production for less than two years and they only made 918 of them. Get it? I don't. Each is individually numbered with little plaques all over the car and one in the center of the Speedo. The 918 is so quick and innovative, it makes you wonder how Porsche will top it once they crawl out of the sewer once again. <laughs> This week's episode is brought to you by Honey. It's a free browser extension that finds you the best deal anytime you shop online. It knows the best coupon code, sale or discount for over 37,000 stores. Just install the extension on your web browser and shop as huge. Pretty much everyone at Donut uses Honey and we love all the great deals we get on equipment and car stuff. It feels great knowing I didn't leave any of my moolah on the table. Honey is super easy to install. It takes just two clicks. I did it in my sleep. Literally, it's that easy. Over 10 million people are already using Honey and saving a bunch of money, and so can you. Remember, it's free. Just click on the link in the description. That's joinhoney.com slash donutmedia to install the number one online shopping assistant. These guys help us pay for the shows that you love. Supporting them supports us. Thank you. Thanks for watching Up to Speed. You want to learn more about Porsches? Check out this episode of my other show, Bumper to Bumper. It's every Tuesday till I die. Up to Speed, still every Thursday. Watch this episode of Wheelhouse. Watch this other episode too. Smash that like button. Hit the subscribe button. You want to buy some merch? Go to donutmedia.com. Follow me on Instagram at Jason Pumphrey. Follow Donut at Donut Media. I love you.